So we have uh, Robert Grayboys, who's a senior research fellow at Mercatus and spoke with us last year. Talking, he talked about two things in the book. Uh, one chapter he had was, was really about the future in technology. And I think Steve Clasco set the stage nicely for that. Um, he also talks about supply side focus for healthcare. But Robert, you're gonna share with us the future of technology in old healthcare post COVID and maybe a little bit on how COVID accelerated that. So thanks, Bob. That I will, and I assume you can hear me now? Yes. Perfect. So to paraphrase Charles Dickens, it was the worst of times, it was the best of times. So we are undergoing with COVID the worst crisis um, any of us has ever seen. I think certainly it's the biggest crisis the world has seen since uh, World War II, um, and in some ways maybe bigger. Uh, you could still live a fairly normal life if you weren't in the war zone then. But on the, the silver lining to this terrible cloud is that I've seen more innovation in healthcare and healthcare policy in the past three or four months than I've seen in the prior 25 years that I've been a health economist or the prior 40 years that I've been an economist of any sort. It has been astounding to watch the policy changes coming and they're revealing. They, they tell us that everyone innately understands that we've had some problems in, uh, in our system of laws, our system of regulations. We have tied our own hands behind our backs and COVID's forced us to, to release them and actually do some work. Let me do a little bit of brief history. If you go back to 2009, the United States had a certain number of doctors, nurses, hospital beds, drugs, and a, sort of an overall budget for drugs, and laboratory equipment, other pieces of medical equipment. <clears throat> we had all of these resources, and we had a bunch of recipes for how you combine them to produce health care. Uh, so we had ingredients and we had recipes. Then in the earth-shattering move of 2010, Congress passed and President Obama signed the Affordable Care Act, which changed an awful lot of things about health care. But what it didn't particularly change was the number of doctors or nurses or hospital beds or drugs or all the other resources or how we use them in care. What it did was it moved resources and availability of them around and, and also the costs. And I'm not here to debate that, the wisdom of it, uh, or, or uh, the, the pluses and minuses. But by and large, before the ACA passed, doctors were pretty busy. Most of them were not twiddling their thumbs. Most of them were not playing with their cell phones all day. They were busy. Uh, same with hospital beds, same with our other medical resources. We didn't have a lot of slack resources. We did have people who the ACA said, these people have not gotten sufficient care. We need to provide more care for them. But if that's true, and if you didn't expand the, the supply of resources or what you do with the resources, that meant somewhere out over on this side, for every hour that someone was gaining here, probably someone over here was losing an hour of time through indirect means, maybe because their, uh, their co-pays went up and they decided to uh, uh, that they would you know, not take care of a problem that they had. So, and also, the ACA said these people need to have some cost relief because healthcare is expensive, as we all know. But if you look at the figures, uh, the trends more or less followed. There wasn't a great deal of change in what we were spending overall, so that if a bunch of people were getting care for less, more care, somebody out there was paying more. And of course, we've seen that through people who were suddenly found their insurance premiums rising or their co-pays or, or other things. So, so there was a lot of shifting around in the ACA of who was getting care, who had access, who was first in line, and who had to pay, pay how much. Essentially, it changed, it, was, it changed how we divided up a fixed pie and who had to pay exactly how much for each slice of that pie. Now, I'm not here to criticize the ACA. 
Um, I, following its passage, of course, we went, we've gone through 10 years of political content, contention over it. And the Republicans over the years introduced an awful lot of bills uh, that generally went under the name repeal and replace uh, that would have torn out chunks of the ACA and altered it with a different vision. And I'm not going to debate those either. But I will say that I can make the same argument and have made the same argument about that whole string of GOP bills that it would have done precisely what the ACA did, which was it would have changed how we divide up the pie and who pays how much for which slice. It didn't, that none of those bills would have substantially altered the supplies of resources and what we do with those resources. Um, and I can also make the same arguments and have made the same arguments about the possibilities of Medicaid expansion, a public option, single payer. All of these, all of these reform ideas uh, are essentially redistributive. And again, I'm not criticizing any of them or saying one is better than the other. But this has been the the way that American healthcare debate has gone for decades. We've argued about how to divvy up the pie and, and who gets to pay for it. Who gets a hospital bed, who doesn't, who pays more, who pays less. And we've funneled all of these questions into a big massive thing called federal health insurance law and regulation. And we have expected insurance law and regulation to do an awful lot of things. It's the, the dashboard for the entire health insurance system. Well, this is a conference on purple solutions. This is about finding bipartisan cooperation, ways to improve health care that can attract support from both parties, a noble goal. I'm not overly optimistic that we will find purple solutions if we are focused on the demand side, on, on these issues like insurance, ACA, single payer, all of those. And again, not because there are good people and bad people in, the, in, in, in this debate, but rather because these are deep philosophical differences between the two parties and between different factions, different segments of each party. And I don't know that you're going to find a great deal of compromise, room for compromise between say someone who favors Medicare, Medicare for all and someone who favors repeal and replace and, and send insurance law back to the states. Uh, they're, they're philosophical differences, and I presume that they are genuine philosophical uh, differences. But what gives me hope, what, what makes me optimistic is, again, the changes not on the demand side, but on the supply side, which I think has been neglected in our healthcare debate over, over many years. And COVID has brought it to the fore in a way that nothing else ever has. And so what have we seen change? I'm, I'm, let me go down a list real quickly. Uh, a lot of it you've heard this morning and this afternoon. Uh, we've talked about uh, there have been changes in the last three or four months in how we view telemedicine, certificate of deed, physician licensing, scope of practice, direct primary care, uh, approval of drugs and devices, uh, relaxation of HIPAA, electronic health records or electronic medical records. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit, if I have time, uh, about retrospective prizes, artificial intelligence we've heard about. Uh, I've written about the medical applications of unmanned aerial vehicles, drones. So what's changed? So let's start with telehealth. I've, I've long been a huge fan of telehealth. I've used it myself. I like to say that in a, it wasn't officially telehealth, but it really was. Uh, telehealth saved my mother's life uh, when she was 92, and she was um, a spry character, and uh, she was on her iPad one night uh, talking by FaceTime to her grandson, who happens to be an emergency doctor, and he was asking how she was doing, and she was feeling pretty good. She said, I have a little problem, a sore down here, and uh, it's not healing right. I'm going to make an appointment and go see the doctor. But, uh, you know, it hurts a bit, but that's it. Well, just by looking through the screen, by looking through the, his computer, his iPad, iPhone, whatever, he was able to look at her face and watch her breathing and see things 
He said, let me, uh, uh, let me get back to you. And he called my brother, who's also a doctor, and said, I think she's in early stages of septic shock. I think you need to get her to a hospital this minute. And those, so they did, and indeed, she had, um, I think it was a MRSA infection, and uh, she would have died. Had she waited a day to call the doctor, she'd have been dead. Well, I've talked to doctors over the years about telehealth, and there's been a lot of skepticism. Well, they didn't teach us that in med school, and I think it's important to be in the room with the patient, whatever. Well, my mother wasn't going to be in a room with a, a doctor that night, and it would have killed her. Well, under COVID, I think an awful lot of doctors, probably most of the doctors in the United States, have suddenly found this telehealth stuff actually is not too bad. I can do an awful lot through a screen, may not have realized it. I'm hoping that this change is going to stick, that we're, that we're going to have much more support over the years for, uh, for telehealth and telehealth of all sorts, telepsychiatry, teleoptometry, there's even teledentistry. So I expect lots of changes in that. And one of the big changes that happened was that for the first time, states more or less said, we don't care where the doctor is sitting. If the doctor is in another state, licensed in another state, well, that's just going to be fine. Let that doctor treat a patient here because at this moment we are desperate. Well, that was a great thing. It was not something new to COVID. The problem of, of Interstate licensing for telemedicine was there before, and I'd been in many sessions where we discussed how can you open up telemedicine to doctors in different states. Well, I think that's, it has happened. I'm hoping it will stick, when, and I think it'll be a, an interesting debate going forward uh, once, once COVID kind of eases up, and I'm not sure when that's going to happen. I have a, I'm one of those who thinks it's going to be around a bit longer than a lot of people think. So what else? Well, I just said physician licensing for telemedicine, but also for just regular hands-on practice. You know, states have these barriers. Uh, you, you lived in medical school, you're licensed in another state. You can't come in here without getting a license. It's expensive, it's time consuming. If you want to practice here, you want to do anything, you're going to have to go through that. Well, when COVID hit, states started saying, you know what, you're in another state, fly on in, we're happy to have you because we are desperate. And it worked rather well. And I think states, a lot of states are getting used to the idea that it's not so bad having the availability of doctors in other states when we have an emergency. Hey, Robert? Um, yes. So you're sort of the transition into the next session on telehealth. So right. So as you're talking about telehealth and the change in licensure, can you just maybe comment on whether you think some of the positive changes in regulations are going to last after this year or after, after COVID? Because that'll lead nicely into our next session. Sure, sure. And uh, let's see, how much time do I have left once I finish that? Uh, well, zero, but that's okay. <laughs> zero, okay. All right. Um, <laughs> Do I think do I think that it's going to last? Um, I think first of all, it depends in part on how long COVID lasts. If this yeah. thing drags out for two years, um, I think we're going to get awfully used to it. I think if it were to end today, if suddenly there were a magic vaccine that was gone, we'd probably try to do a bit of backsliding. Right. So, so yes. So the regulatory loosening could last if COVID lasts. <laughs> right. And, and I'm hoping that it won't require that. I'm hoping that, that we won't, um, yeah, you know, that even if it were to end tomorrow, we would have realized this is pretty good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, any, sorry to uh, cut things here. Are there any sort of things that you, you, you wanted to get in that we didn't get in? That uh... Just a couple. I, I, I rattled off my list and a lot of it's been yeah. discussed today. Uh, I, my website uh, at, at Mercatus has all of this stuff. I mean, there, there are a couple of them. I would just, I'll, I'll just repeat. I think for the discovery of new vaccines and drugs, it's worth looking at the Eureka Prizes, which are retrospective prizes, rather than the government trying to guess in advance who's going to find a vaccine, simply dangle a reward out there and saying, whoever gets it first, here's a pile of money for you. Uh -huh. and, and the use of artificial intelligence. I think when I was there in, uh, 
at Concordia last year. I talked about the fact that I had had a bout of atrial fibrillation and that through a marvelous device on my phone and now it's on my, my Apple Watch. I've been able to avoid going to the emergency room several times, saving untold thousands of dollars to somebody because I have remote telemetry and artificial intelligence measuring my heartbeat saying, nope, you don't need to go. Yeah. That is the future. And I think Steve Clasco got us pretty excited about that vision that, that you're painting as well. Yes, he did. So, all right. Well, thanks, Bob. I really appreciate it. And, and I'll just throw out one more. If anyone wants to talk to me, my email address is out there. I would love to engage in conversations on this. Awesome. Thank you, Bob.